Hello everyone, I'm Felicia. I'm the media chair for 2020 NCLF as well as the founder of Tiny Cast Company. I am joined by Katie Kwan and even though I could give her my own bio of what I know of her and the many years I've known her, I'm going to read off of her bio from here. Is, uh, Katie is the chef and founder of Rice Paper Scissors, a Vietnamese pop-up restaurant in San Francisco. Under her stewardship, uh, Rice Paper Scissors grew from a small pop-up to a lunch, lunch spot in corporate catering company. Along the way, she participated in discussions with Anthony Bourdain and Eddie Wong that explored the site guise of food, authenticity, and Asian American entrepreneurship. At the helm, Katie believes that food is the portal to the stories, cultural experience, and homes of who we are today. Amazing. Wow. I know. When you read it, it seems like even more amazing. I feel like I'm going to need to know myself even more. Yeah. I mean, like, I don't know how many times you've had to write in a bio, but like the few times I have, I'm like, ooh, I'm cool. <laughs> yeah, right? It's kind of yeah. nice. <laughs> Good point to self-reflect. Yeah. Um, I know, I know I invited like, um, Wilson to join us. Um, so hopefully uh -huh. coming in. Is he crash? Yeah. Oh, I yeah. Hope he cooks. But, um, yeah, I mean like to, to kind of like kick off the conversation here, you know, the whole idea is, um, fish sauce and other remedies. And like, you know, uh, when I first started, uh, when I first joined you as your first intern in 2012, mm. all of eight years ago now, um, wow. you know, I remember Amazing. that you're saying that um, it looks like we just have Maria joining us now um, here. But um, as I'm interviewing Katie, yeah, we're just, um, uh, you said that you wanted fish sauce to be uh, like a home item across America. And your big, yeah, your big, hairy, audacious goal was to have fish sauce being a, uh, yeah, the household item and the household name. Um, can you talk to me about that whole process and like, where it was like fish sauce or like versus like soy sauce or like any of these other things that like led you to that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, when I started Rice Paper Scissors, I had lost my job. It was kind of a time like this, which is like during the housing crisis. Um, and there were a lot of people who were re-examining their lives. They were trying to understand what they were doing and what their purpose was. And I was one of those people. I had a whole cohort of people to come up with me. Um, and so for the first, I would say year, I was just doing soul searching and I started a food blog, to kind of share this idea of um, kind of chasing these recipes that I felt like were, were disappearing because our generations were moving on. We were getting further away from our homelands. I'm Chinese, um, but I also took an opportunity to go travel to Vietnam, which, uh, was recommended to me. I had no idea what to expect. And wow, it was, it blew me away. It was, it, I, I, it was the first time I'd ever traveled by myself. And that in and of itself is super special. And the way that you are able to interact with people in your daily life when you travel by yourself is really unique. A lot of times when you travel, you're traveling with someone, you're always talking to someone, you're talking in your comfortable tongue, you're still kind of comfortable in this greater world. But when you start traveling by yourself, you put yourself in a situation that's not necessarily familiar and you have to learn to adapt and learn to be comfortable. And so there I really flourished under that. It challenged me and I also challenged my palate. I hadn't really eaten that much Vietnamese food and I really loved it. I think just from the food to the freshness, to the flavors, to the custom of eating on the street really helped me open up as a person. Sitting down, observing how people cook and then talking to them and whatever limited language skills I had at the time uh, was wonderful. And I, I attribute that trip to kind of, you know, in part changing my life, uh, which is why it's so special to me. There's sauce that is. Um, shortly thereafter, I started Rice Paper Scissors with Valerie Liu. And what we wanted to do was recreate Vietnam in San Francisco. So we set up a whole bunch of little red stools, which is iconic in Vietnam. And we came up with a menu in about, and a pop-up and a business in about three days. And so one of the main drivers of that was fish sauce, getting low, hanging out. And to me, it just kind of signifies this relaxed way of life in this, in this way of life where you're able to hang out with people, how to meet people, be a little bit less serious about yourself and, um, and just like embrace that funky flavor of fish sauce. And so when we built our company, that's what we were there for. We, were there, we weren't there to like make fancy food. We weren't there to kind of try to 
uh, interpret the, the dishes for someone else. We interpreted it for us. And what that meant was embracing kind of the weird aspects of our culture, the things that we uh, treasure, but we find feel kind of foreign to other people. And one of those things was fish sauce. And to me, it just is like a really good idea of trying to welcome something that you didn't necessarily know before, that you didn't necessarily feel comfortable before into your house, welcome it into your home. And that was kind of our, our like, our big, hairy, audacious goal. That was our, our mission. And so for the past eight years, we've been doing so. Um, I don't know the first time I had pho, probably when I was like 10. But, you know, I, I do know that a lot of people these days haven't had it. And so when we grow our corporate catering company, we ended up serving to companies of 700 people and we would only serve them pho, which is crazy. You imagine all these people trying it for the first time. Uh, so that's where it came from. We wanted it to kind of stand for people welcoming culture into their life, people welcoming something different, people embracing someone different. And we want it to be a staple. I mean, I know it's a staple in a lot of Asian households, right? Like everyone's got their version of fish sauce, you know? Um, and I want everyone to be able to do that. So that's what we, our mission was. And we've done that with food. And then more recently, we've done that with our fish sauce hats, which are just hats that say fish sauce. But when we were trying, we were trying to create something wearable that people could have, we thought, what better than fish sauce? It's succinct, it's to the point, it's very clear, you know? Get weird, basically. Yeah, for sure. And I, I do want to say hello to two people who just joined us, Tosh, um, a friend of mine from Ninang Silly Story Time, as well as someone named Hero. Hello, welcome. Uh, as well as Vivian, it looks like. So uh, to quickly just like intro you in right now, I'm, I'm Felicia. Um, I am having a conversation with Katie about fish sauce and other remedies. We kind of just went over um, um, our background of knowing each other now for eight years, as well as like building um, what uh, Katie went through her background of building rice paper scissors, the whole idea of what it means to bring fish sauce to uh, people's homes. And, um, and yeah, and then using that as a, uh, uh, a way using food to like connect people and that being always like the central idea and, and how we're moving forward. So um, I don't know how many people are joining us in our activity today, but to kind of just like give a little preview of what is going on. Yes, uh, we have Tehran Cam right here um, as Tosh has a uh, uh, shout it out. Um, this is Saba. This is the cousin to the plantain, uh, or sorry, cousin to the uh, banana. I also have a big <gasps> section of jackfruit here. Generally, I like to do this. Oh, there's, hey, Wilson. Wilson's there. I generally like to do this um, with canned, but I couldn't find canned at the Korean store, so I went, but surprisingly enough, they had it fresh. So I'm going fresh. Um, and then just a quick intro of the things that I do. It's here's a banana. I cut uh, the saba. I cut in half. I put some um, uh, brown sugar. I'm laying down a, a little layer of um, jackfruit first. I get half of my banana. I'm putting her down in here. Okay. And then uh, what I like to do is I say tip to tip. All right. We're going to get mountains first. See there? We got little mountain peaks. Tip, tip. And then we go envelope. Envelope means the right, the right side, we're gonna go in, and then left side, we're gonna go in. So now I'm gonna bring it up. We got the envelope. After the envelope, we're gonna do the roll. I like to roll and pull. So it's like roll and pull, so that you know we're keeping it tight. Um, I'm rolling it again, rolling and pulling again. And then I like to have a bowl of water in a nondescript soup bowl that I put my sugar fingers in to make a little bit of a glue. And then I tap the, the top mountain peak with a little bit of water, the little bit of glue. And then we, we, we close her up by just rolling her over. So now we got that seam there. We just kind of keep that juicy so that it fuses with the other part of the wrapper. And then we put her down. She is beautiful, thank you. Uh, Katie, do you want to take a moment to like go through what you're, what you're making? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, cool. Um, I'm making dumplings, which is something I make a lot of, not as much recently, and I kind of feel like I should be, because it's a... Looks like we dropped Katie. Make your New Year's. You can Did hear you me? You said, you said, um, it's not, it's not that it's a common or something like that. 
Oh, no, no. Yeah. So I make um, dumplings and I used to make it more. But now that we're in quarantine, sometimes it's hard because you're just making a lot of them. And it's something that you do with family or during New Year. So I figured I would do it today because I have time. And it's something we don't usually do is sit around and cook and talk. So I have this massive amount of filling. Just it smells good. Um, and what else do I have? I have this dough. Um, I go into the store. I went to Manila Oriental Market and I got this. I got to show you. I'm so excited. I got this. Like, I don't know who can celebrate this more than I can. Yes. This is, I don't know. It probably has something really secretive inside, but I'm so stoked to use it. I haven't tried it yet, but you know, it, where they lead me, I will follow is basically. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. you used it in your the, the your dough today. I used it in my dough. Yes. Oh, and so so special. I, uh, <laughs> so special. I was like having a party in the aisle. Um, and so I rolled in the dough, and I kind of rolled into cylinders like this. The sun follows me, so I'm gonna keep scooting as we talk. Um, and then I like to do like what the old grandmas do, or just like pull it off um, rather than cut it or anything. And it's a really great way to like test how big your portion size is. And I make little uh, circles. I'm gonna roll it out using this uh, dowel that someone left me um, into this. And then I'll fill it with filling and I'll show you. So my filling has pork, ginger, scallions, sesame oil, some cabbage that I had the like presence of mind to salt yesterday, which is super OG. And I put them in like this. It's so hard to see. Here we are, just like a, pe a pile of, of yummy. And then I like to cut, close it up and I'm not super, um, what's the word, worried or like, I'm not, a, I'm not a big pleater. I just feel like it's, nah, who cares? I'm making uh, boiled dumplings, not pot stickers. So that's why I don't really care about pleating. But I do, I do love a good pinch. So here we are, pinching it off. Anyways, that's what I'm doing. Amazing. Well, thank you for walking you through that process. Um, I, I guess there was the, I'm, I'm looking, I'm using my sticky fingers to also be on my mouse and like trying to click through our talking points here. So I guess at some point um, we wanted to talk more about like our own connection and like our, uh, like what, I mean, like, I, I would say a little bit about my, my experience when I'm working with breasts for scissors. I remember the stark difference from going from, um, going from pop-ups. I actually just shared a picture on my Facebook of a pop, the pop-up that, like, the interns were in charge of. I don't know if you yeah. saw that picture. The interns were in charge of a pop-up, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, like, not even out of college. I'm, like, 21 years old. I'm, like, you know what would be great? pajama party pop-up and so like we buy all of these pajamas from and I remember I, I to this day I still have flashes my brain keeps this memory is that you're allergic to maybe like acrylic or like vinyl or some polyester something I don't know why you told me you were allergic to it so I couldn't buy you this pajama from from like Kame in uh what, clement street in the city so i was like okay i guess i think i'll buy katie some special pajamas for this party and and um yeah i mean like i remember the stark difference from uh pop-ups going into catering you know a lot of a big thing for me was always being connected with people and and, and building an experience for people and you know especially during COVID 19 as an event planner that's like zero that's like not happening at all and so that was like really really hard and it kind of reminds me of that time where we went from was a hard shift from pop-ups to catering. And I was like, I'm not seeing these people enjoy the foods. But I mean, you were saying there's a benefit to it that we were giving these people like maybe the first time that they would ever try pho with us, you know? And I remember creating the DIY pho bar, all the signage, poking the steel, the metal steel into the to-go containers so that they wouldn't overflow when we filled it with hot boiling broth or like carrying like 25 pounds worth of broth down like 18 stairs. I remember it was 18 because I would count it so I wouldn't eat shit every time at the end of the, the stairs. You're like, it was cutting as fuck, but I mean, it was a great process. I loved it. It taught me definitely how to like keep things a hustling. And I think that's like part of the reason why we're also having this conversation too, you know, is, is like, what did we have to do to make those transitions into like COVID-19? What do we have to do to transition to take care of our family? And what are the things that we're doing to like take care of ourselves? So I think like this whole idea of this like round table right now is to get people to like have these conversations with 
themselves and with others to see like what do people feel safe to do at this time what are people comfortable with so i kind of do want to explore that a little bit more and maybe we can start off well first of all do you have any response to like, the, like what my experience was from when i first moved up here when i first was here not only was i your first intern i was your first employee so coming out here in 2013 and rocking with the offer about a year and a half two years what was your experience in that transition as well well, um, yeah, Felicia was definitely a lot of our firsts. And in fact, I, I walked the, the path from uh, one of our first office spaces to our second office space, which was actually the first day that Felicia was with us. She helped us move. And by move, I mean like put everything on an office chair and roll it down the street. <laughs> um, yeah, we were really scrappy. We had nothing except for a big dream. Um, and we, we didn't even have kitchen tools. We had no kitchen. So we would go to other people's houses and we had a pop-up, we would sit there and count how, how many dishes we had, how many things, like how many utensils it would take to execute a dish. We would count how many tongs we had and say, okay, well, I can grab two for my mom and my sister can bring one. And it was definitely a, a, like a community effort. Like everyone was involved. Everyone's household items were involved. And so for us, like someone probably brought their own fish sauce or someone brought a knife to help us out. So it's definitely something that's been really central to our business is just working together. Um, the transition was definitely uh, different for us. We started out doing a lot of pop-ups and that was super gratifying. And uh, we were able to feature so many dishes that no one really knew about. And then when we transitioned into corporate catering, we also did a lunch spot. So we tried to like balance it. We always had a pop-up of some sort. And then the corporate catering allowed us to grow a little bit more, have a little bit more dependability, and then just like sneak fish sauce into every single person's mouth. Like every single person who ate our stuff was eating fish sauce and they may or may not have known it, which is magic. Because if you mention that thwarted word to some people, they're like, oh, that's no. But I'm like, oh, you like curry? They're like, I love curry. I'm like, oh, you like pho? I love pho. I'm like, you know what? I got to be sneaky about this. I'm not as sneaky anymore because of my hats. But in the beginning, we had to be sneaky about the fact that we were trying to introduce people to something that really meant a lot to us and had a place in our home and, 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 and trying and, and hoping that they would also like it and also bring it into their home. So that was like the transition. And then in terms of COVID, I mean, my business went through a lot of changes. We were a pop-up, we did a lunch spot, we did corporate catering. Uh, we tried to open a restaurant, which we're, at this point, we're very thankful that never happened. <laughs> um, but it was a huge project and super fun and allowed us to envision and think about what it would be like to have a restaurant, what it would feel like, what it would look like, what we would serve. And in a way we kind of exercise, like did that exercise both, you know, in person, but just not with the restaurant. Um, when the pandemic hit, it was very clear to us that we couldn't continue to do corporate catering. I mean, no one is really there. No one's going into the office anymore. Uh, so we spent the next five or six weeks just catering to people that mattered. And it was so striking how our business came very full circle in the end. Uh, we linked up with the SF Health Center, which does a lot of mobile COVID testing as well as HIV testing. And we cooked for them. So we, we made meals for their clients or their patients who had to eat with a lot of the meds that they took. So we built a lot of meals for them. And then we also were able to cater to the staff itself, probably about 25 to 30 people a day for, you know, the entire month of, I believe it was May. And it was really gratifying. And it kind of got us back to what we were here to do. And the organization itself, there, there was a lot of APIs in there. There's a lot of fish sauce loving people and we would serve them dishes. And they were always like, yeah, I want those garlic noodles. That's my favorite or those, you know, spring rolls, those are my favorite. So it was really nice to be able to get feedback like that from an organization that was super appreciative of it. And for anyone who's in the hospitality industry and in a lot of other industries as well, we aim to be community oriented and to help one another. And not only, you know, it is a business, but let's just, I mean, if you want to be a millionaire, you're not going into hospitality. <laughs> so there's part of it that's just about, um, wanting to spread goodwill. And we did that in the end. And uh, and after a while, you know, there was a point where we would have to say like, hey, we're just gonna go in hibernation right now for obvious reasons. 
Um, but what we started to do is sell our fish sauce hats, which are pretty awesome. And Mike, Ross is just Wilson, I think he's wearing it. Wilson, are you wearing it? Can you model for us, please? Thank you. Come on, give us. Give Thank us you. The back of it. Give us the back of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give us a full turn. There we go. Thank you, Wilson. Amazing. Wow, male model. Um, yeah, so we made the fish sauce hats and they're kind of like a secret little like hand gesture, like, like a secret thing that we can all participate in that we can all still celebrate. And it's very interesting when you see like orders come in for people who also want to participate in this like, I know it's just a token, but it binds us all together, which is nice. And uh, we can still, I, it makes me smile. It makes me happy that I can see people kind of understanding where we're coming from as well. So I think fish sauce has kind of nursed me through a lot of this pandemic and a lot of the hard times, because to me, it means uh, family, it means community, it means gathering around food, which is something I love to do and cook and make. Um, and so it's been pretty nurturing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I do want to start transitioning over to, you know, the, the sense of, of family, you know, the, the reason why we're even like the, why we're making this or the, the, the thought about making our repeatable tasks is the idea that we would generally be doing this with friends and family. You know, I, uh, I like was telling a story to, uh, to my friend, what I, I taught my nephew how to, to make Turon just last week. And I was saying how, like, I remember being so juiced about making Turon every time it happened that like, even at a young age, I like started to learn how to like gather all these things myself. Like that's probably how I probably first learned how to open up like a can of something. I was like, oh, like, please open this can of lanka, which is jackfruit so that I can like use this for, um, my Tron or like, yeah, knowing like one time I got hard corrected that this is Saba and not a banana. And I, you know, like, you know, I'm learning ingredients. I'm learning like the traditions of my family and my, like my culture through these things. And so, yeah, I, I do want to talk about family um, specifically and, and during a time of COVID because, you know, everyone here is relatively young. Uh, you know, like we're in a place where we're having, we have parents that are in that group that is in the high risk area, you know, so like times where we would just be like, let's just go visit our parents or let's go like have a meal. Like it's just not happening. And even tasks that seem so integral to our own like culture is not happening. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to transition us over and if there's more you wanted to share about your family, I know you have a big family and, and I know how much important it, like the food aspect of all of that was for you. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, I'm one of five. So yeah, I have a lot of family and we're all here in the Bay Area, which is even crazier. We range, there's like 11 years from the oldest to the youngest. Um, and I feel like that gap gets smaller and smaller as you get older. Um, so it's, it's been really hard. I think my parents, my dad, my parents live around Chinatown, Knob Hill Chinatown. And they actually were early adopters of of just being, you know, being safe and, and practicing safety precautions because they're like, we're Chinese. <laughs> We've seen where this has gone before, you know, like this is not new. They understood SARS, they understood. And I think that the greater also, you know, Asian community also is, is more familiar with these types of things just by the, by way of it already having happened a couple of times before. Um, and so my parents were early adopters. We actually, they actually didn't go, like leave the house for two weeks and then we would bring them groceries and it's just been a super struggle. I mean, it's hard to be in your own space, like cooped up for so long. It's hard to lose all your autonomy. Like they are our parents. They've raised five children. They're, you know, badass people, but all of a sudden we're going to treat them like babies, you know? cook for them, get stuff for them, argue about their safety and all the safety precautions that we have to go through. And I felt a process where they were kind of almost in, in so many ways losing their free will. And there was a specific incident that happened where my, you know, we're all in the same text family thread, which is a great way to stay in touch. But sometimes it can, I would say 90% of the arguments that we've had as a family is just about COVID. Um, and we got an argument about 
how they're going to get their groceries and limiting their exposure. And one of my brothers um, is a little bit more serious, not more serious, he's just very serious about um, his precautions. And so he quarantined himself by himself in his own space and would only go out to get them groceries. He felt like that was his sacrifice, his, his way of caring for them was to sacrifice his, his quality of life to stay inside so he could be as healthy as possible so he could perform these tasks and then deliver it. Um, and then my little sister, her, you know, love language is service as well. And she wanted to as well. And we got into kind of an argument about how many people should bring them groceries, you know? And uh, that's really hard. You know, you don't really know how to take care of your family. And we're sitting here having this like conversation on a text thread that they're involved in. And halfway through, I was just like, why don't we ask them, you know? Because there's a part of um, this experience, especially when you're older, is all of a sudden your, your free will is almost taken away. Um, people really want to help, but they don't know how. And I think typically in Asian families, or I guess in my family in Chinese culture, you know, there's a lot of people, like things go unsaid. People aren't the clearest. They're not the most direct. They are maybe more direct through their actions, but not necessarily through their words. So for me, it was, um, it was hard to do it, but I felt, I think it was really important to just try to give voice to what was going on and trying to figure out how we we're going to care for them, both from a safety perspective and a mental perspective. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I'm reading some of the notes here in our previous conversations, you know, it's the idea that like, like time is what affection is in these kind of cultures, you know, like the time you spend together, even if it's not doing anything, just being near each other is like good enough. And it's like, by the way, this whole time I'm saying, I love you, but no words and no physical. You know? So it's like, okay, exactly. I know that we're not, we can't spend time with each other. We're asking, we're asking everyone, not even just our parents, but we're asking everyone to cross a, a digital threshold. So, you know, I do want to say hello to the people who just joined us, but uh, Dylan, hey, nice to see you again. Marissa, uh, one, Quinn Young, um, and me as well. I, I'm, I'm really excited that y'all joined us and joined us our conversation here. But, you know, we're asking people to join us digitally. And it's like, I'm, I'm really not trying to be ageist, but, you know, it, there is a type of person that has grown up with digital thus far and has made the transition easier. And there are other people who did not have those accesses. So a lot of the work that I'm doing nowadays, you know, with TinyCast is trying to make um, digital accessible. And it's not because, like, you know, speaking back on the hospitality thing, you know, it wasn't just restaurants and, and retails or, you know, the places that get served in person. It's everybody who had any sort of space that didn't, that, spoke to someone aloud in person was affected. So a lot of these like organizations, nonprofit, arts, you know, and like even with like the food industry, like I'm trying to figure out what is the way that we can bridge the gap between what is the tangible and the digital and making sure that we're continuously connecting to our constituents. Only to say that I do feel like I'm not doing a great, I mean, this is a feeling, but I feel like I'm not doing a great job of bridging the gap between um, my family and the digital things that I need to do, you know, uh, like my mom, I like, she has like, her Wi-Fi is so bad and she's staying, she's at her own space, you know, and like I'm 400 miles away from her, you know, how close I am to my mom. And so like, and when I FaceTime her, it just like, hello, no, you know, and it's just like this constant battle of trying to get her connected, you know, and it, it's like not happening. And so, you know, like, I guess the question is like, what, do we do what do we do to stay connected you know like what are our opportunities during this time um you know that's kind of like where the next checkpoint for us is like, what are the tools we used to connect now what pastimes do we share with loved ones you know what are we cooking right now to like get through all of this i suppose if you want to kind of just start with that um yeah and i'd love to hear from everyone else if they can join in um the tools that we use to connect with our family well personally for me it's time like you said there's a lot of actions, no I love you words, but there's a lot of time we spend there. And so I think every week or every other week we try to get together, but we're like sitting outside in a backyard six feet apart. Half the time my brother is yelling at someone to put his mask on, you know, um, but we try to do that. My parents go for a walk every day and they bring my niece or their granddaughter every day, which is really nice. And I, and I try to meet them, but there's these, you know, it's a different way of life now. I'm 
hugely thankful that humans are super adaptable, that we are able to adapt to these new settings and are able to make the best of things or can try to. Um, so definitely trying to spend time with them. I'm wondering, and I, and I haven't gone here yet, and I'm curious to pull the room, which is what if I explored a different way to communicate I love you? Like, do I just go ahead and just call them up and say it? It's not typically how I practice this, but I feel like, you know, we are all evolving. This landscape is evolving. And so perhaps I have to look into different ways. Um, you know, I tried my best. I went to the grocery store. I bought my mom like some green, um, you know, red beans, green beans to make soups because she that's what she always wants. And so I can do it through gifts, I can do it through service, I want to buy them some outdoor chairs. But I'm also thinking like, yeah, I need to bridge that digital divide, as you mentioned. Um, I need to just call them up. I don't know, phones are really weird for us. I don't know how everyone else feels. Yeah, um, let's tag someone. Let's, uh, it looks like Dylan's looking straight at the camera right now. So uh, Dylan, if you want to go ahead and quickly introduce yourself um, and say hello to everyone else in the room. And then, yeah, like maybe speak on, on your thoughts about this, how we can like start bridging the gaps here. Just to clarify real quick, bridging the gap of like intergenerational communication via internet. I think just in general connection with, with people. And, but yes, also that like we are, we're talking about, um, family, you know, specifically our elderly. But yeah, it's, feel free to speak on any faction of that or any perspective of that. I see. Uh, well, first of all, my name's Dylan. Um, I've been involved with um, CLUSA um, with a lot of th this event so far, and um, I was I was really interested. I, I like saved this event um, as one of the few that I would definitely attend, even though I was I've, I've been pretty busy, so I wasn't able to make many. But um, I definitely cordoned off some time for this one specifically. Um, yeah, regarding um, bridging that gap, I think a lot of it has to do with um, the younger generation being kind of shy um, and not necessarily literally shy as in like, um, oh, I don't want to ever talk to you, but it's like um, not being fully comfortable expressing certain aspects themselves and therefore um, unable to totally open themselves up um, because I can only speak of this from a personal, like a, a young person um, perspective. I'm only 23 right now. So um, as, as things go, I'm pretty, I'm pretty young. Um, and so I do believe that it's, it's hard to open up to your parents, um, to, to elderly um, grandparents. Um, you don't want it, to, it's often like you don't want to burden them with things that are just your life, your, your experience. Um, like I can tough it out. And at the same time, it's like, how will they receive it? How will it be received? And um, I think both perspectives are just something that uh, trouble us when we do it. And nowadays, especially in like a digital world, I'm lucky enough that I just like went back home because um, you know I was I was at school in New York, and so um, flying back, um, and st I'm, I've been staying in the um, the family house for um, since since March. So. Um, I, I'm able to just talk to them. And I think we've got, had a lot of hard conversations in the past uh, couple months. Um, not to say that that's every day. Some days it's just like, hey, let's just watch a movie together. Um, but um, some days are like, oh, wow, that was not a conversation I was expecting to ever have. Um, and I think it's just the willingness for one party to open up. And if one party decides to be vulnerable, then um, as long as, as long as we can uh, have some level of mutual respect for one another, I think everyone becomes vulnerable. Um, and that's what I've been sensing recently. And I think, I think I'm one of the lucky few who have been able to experience that. I know there are plenty of um, home situations that aren't quite so fortunate, um, but it's just my own experience. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us, Dylan. I think, I think you're right. I think we're, you know, as, um, uh, uh, I'm coming from an entrepreneurial perspective and Katie, you'll probably be doing this too, type A, kind of like, yeah, like, what can we do, you know? But I think it's, you're right, Dylan, I think you're speaking on the idea of like, what is that even the friction for us to, to get to that point of even communicating, you know, like, let alone just the digital, like, what is that, what are some learned behaviors or learned, um, yeah, like learned, uh, I guess the word is um, uh, coping mechanisms to like, 
kind of dodge a little bit of the friction that can come from like, for me, the word that came up to mind was like, how can I make sure that I'm still honoring my elders uh, without sounding like I'm questioning them or, but uh, at the same time, I don't want to belittle them by caring for them because oftentimes we're taught that if you are given care, you are the, the, the sub, the B, the, you know, like the one that is the baby, you know, like we don't want to baby our, our parents or our, our elders, you know? So thank you for sharing that. I think the, a lot for me too, is like the shyness is coming from, um, yeah, like being hesitant in not knowing what are the opportunities or what could be possibly said. So Katie, I, I think you were, you were, you were actively listening with the head nods too. Do you want to share a little bit more as well in response to Dylan? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I, I give kudos to Dylan. It's a very hard thing to, to get vulnerable with your parents. It's very seldom in my family. And so I'm envious of you and I applaud you. Um, I think, wow. Uh, yeah, I think it's been, you know, as a, from an entrepreneurial perspective, it's weird because actually my parents are entrepreneurs, I suppose they own their own businesses and uh, my sister does, she has her own practice as well. But, you know, it was funny, the first couple weeks this happened, there was just like a flurry of emails being like, apply for the PPP loan, get the EIDL loan, like all these different things. And you're like, okay, you know, and so we we're, learn from real late like that, or you talk about stocks that you wish you bought, you never bought, and like whatever happened to Tesla, whatever. Um, and then there's a point where, and this is really hard, is that some of my um, siblings like kind of continue to be employed throughout the pandemic. Um, and then there's entrepreneurs that just have to shift. They just have to like, and that is super hard too, because first of all, your parents probably don't even want you being an entrepreneur. Just kidding. Not my, my parents. Yeah. They were like, wow, no. Um, they wanted me to have something steady. And I guess I understand why, because of times like this. Um, and so it's kind of been hard. It's been hard to even have a conversation about, oh, what are you doing right now? You know, how are you, you know, getting by? And it's funny because I've had friends who aren't Asian. And they've had these conversations with their parents and it has a different tone and it has a different thing. And, 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 if, and I imagine in my head, like, oh, if I had those conversations, it would have a different tone. It would have this like impending sense of doom. However, I do think that's probably also just in my head. And so instead of allowing that to stop me from showing them love or trying to show up, um, I've had to kind of struggle with that and, and, and meet that challenge head on, which is like, okay, like, I know they might ask some uncomfortable questions, they may not, but I still want to be there for them. And so trying not to avoid those, those things in spite, you know, you know, in, you know, instead, I, I don't want to avoid those things, I want to be able to be with them. So that's been a personal challenge. Yeah, for sure. Um, how about um, Tosh and, and Wilson, maybe you want to share a little bit about uh, maybe what Dylan said, you know, I feel like it was like, we like kind of like started progressing the conversation, but kind of the original question is like, what is bridging the gap for communications and connecting, especially with family and your community? Um, I think personally for me, what has been, so I'm the eldest, I'm the older sister in the Filipino family. So there's a lot of like this type of pressure or just this idea of how somebody should be or how the eldest daughter should be. My dad didn't talk to me for three months when he found out I got a tattoo. <clears throat> and his reasoning was like, because girls shouldn't be getting tattoos. And I'm like, no, your girl should not be getting a tattoo. Because he had no problem with anyone else's tattoos but mine. Um, but what I have found really helpful, especially in like the very inflammatory political time, has been understanding that my parents and all of my older family members are persons. like understanding their personhood and not getting so mad about whatever judgment they have or just like whatever feeling and understanding that they have lived a completely different context of my life and now here we are meeting in the middle. Um, so because of that I've been able to have much better conversations, have been much more patient actually um, and listening with like and then not just trying to react very differently, um, you know, not trying to re be so reactive in people's responses and even in my own family. Um, and what has happened is like, my mom has never really called me about really anything except just like how I'm doing. And now she calls me about like 
stuff with her sister. And she's like, you know, your auntie said this to me and I, and I said this to her and I was like, mom, I'm really proud of you because my mom is super po passive. And this is like a very, um, it's very common in a lot of like Filipino fam families too, is like women from that generation, like the baby boomer generation, you're just, you just agree. Like you're really not supposed to make any splash and you just agree with the family and that's it. And even if, even if people are bullying you, even if your own family is bullying you. Um, and so my, my mom was just talking to me about how she told her sister, like, you can't talk to me like that. <laughs> and this is like, there, I mean, this is baby boomer generations. And I'm like listening to this and kind of, at first it was very strange to hear this from like a daughter mother perspective, like, oh, is she like really trying to like talk to me like we're homies, you know? And, and um, it was really cool to like find that relationship with my mom because we never really had that. Um, and so now she like, we text more, we talk more. Um, and this was, you know, this was during pandemic because her, her brother in the Philippines passed away <clears throat> of COVID. And so it was in the Philippines and we had to do, um, we had to do a Zoom uh, prayer. So for in our family, you know, we pray for the dead for at least for nine days and then at the 40th day. So of course I'm the one that's setting up because I'm the millennial setting up the Zoom and the first day, you know how long it took for everyone to sign on? 45 minutes. 45 minutes, prayer was supposed to start at five, every, you know, and then some people couldn't figure it out. Like they had to call in and I was just, and I was losing patience, right? Cause I'm like, dude, just do this. But they're like that generation, they're like, just tell me what to do. And like, they were not even, they didn't even bat an eyelash of like their connectivity. Like for me, I'm like already given up after like five minutes of trying to sign on. And they're, you know, trying to work with me and everyone else was super patient, the people who did get it. And then by the second day, it was like 15 minutes for everyone to sign on. And then by like the third day, people were in the room before I was even in there. So it was, it was cool to have this, the gap or the bridging of the gap was understanding that I'm a millennial and I grew up with the internet and this is how you use this. And this is the best way to use it. And they like, you know, they're, everyone is listening because the whole world is online right now. Um, so I think that has helped tremendously, right? Is just knowing that I have a specific skill set. It's you want to post on Instagram, you want to post on your Facebook story, you want to do this. Like I've been like tech support in that way. Um, so yeah, it's been that has helped. And but really, the you know the takeaway is just everyone is a person. There's a personhood behind your grandmother, your aunt, they have their own experiences. And you, even though they have this role, so-called role in your life, um, what does that role even mean? And like, what is the context of that? But rather than looking at this person in front of you as a person with feelings and emotions and that. And I don't think, as, you know, being Asian American, we're taught that to look at our parents. We're like taught, we're taught to look at them like, temples, <laughs> um, these pillars of everything, which is still true, but also understanding that, you know, I know that you're hurting and you might be tired of being in this too. And, um, you know, kind of honoring that. So, yeah. Thanks for sharing, Tosh. Um, Wilson, did you want to share as well? Um, no, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm just going to let... <laughs> can you just show everyone the fish sauce hat one more time just so that everyone can just <laughs> there you go thank you uh, and marissa i see that you turned your camera on i hope that means you'd like to share with us um how has your experience thus far been with like bridging the gap i know you're doing a lot of things on the back end here even for our own um, events um well with my family uh so i don't live with my family for couple months when the quarantine started um, I was with my boyfriend's family and they set up a couple of like fun zoom calls like doing trivia with each other so that was fun to participate in um, and it was mostly like young people so it was pretty quick to like log in and everything and then um, there was one time where I FaceTimed my mom and she happened to be FaceTiming my grandma on a different device. So I was like seeing my grandma through two devices. So that was pretty funny. Um, I don't know. I feel like with the, with like FaceTime and Zoom, that's been good. Um, 
but I've also been like utilizing group chats too with um, some of my family and also friends as well. And I think, I don't know if someone said this already, but like, like how much do you share over text? And like, how comfortable are you like in a family group text too? Like in my family's group text, there's probably like three or four main contributors to that text who are like really excited about things. And like, I'll jump in sometimes or like I'll share a photo, but like something that I ate or like, for example, like the sky outside, everyone was sharing photos last week um, in California. Uh, um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like it's been okay. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing with us, Marissa. I really appreciate that. Um, it looks like we're coming up onto our last 15 minutes here. And so I want to make sure that we're, we're, I know, right? I know. How many have you made? How many? I, <laughs> this is, this is, yeah. oh, damn. Okay. <laughs> um, you're currently muted right now, but I do want to like start turning over to the uh, conversation. There will always be a, a sugar water spill during Tyrone making, by the way. <laughs> just um, yeah, I just want to transition over to like, you know, yes, family, you know, and yes, we, I think we're, we all know that it's very, very nuanced what we each as individuals need to do. And Tosh, I do want to say thank you so much for bringing up, you know, the thought of like, all right, our family are also just people in this too. So what can, how would we communicate to someone else experiencing this, you know? So I do see myself being like, kinder with my mother even you know like not that I was ever mean but you know like it's just like you know just kinder and in my conversations with her like if I know there's a lull in the conversation I know she's just taking some time to like figure out something else to tell me you know and I'm like I just want to give her so much time to talk to me I, I like talked to her last week for like two hours on the phone about nothing seemingly but you know I also was able to talk about uh, you know, some troubles I've been having with like mental health and things like that, which I had never done so with my mom before, you know, and so we had a really great conversation about even the way we feel with friends, you know, about, um, about um, uh, how sometimes we, we like to choose our own family and how we feel well supported and loved that way. Um, so, you know, that it was nice to have that conversation. And so I guess like now let's talk about our chosen family and maybe our community at large and even maybe even like the industry, you know, right now we are seeing four of uh, three other chefs that are doing demos and Q and A's and, you know, so I would be, I, you know, I don't know if this would necessarily be the case had, had COVID not happened, you know, most chefs are in the kitchen 12 hours a day, they clock in, they clock out, you know, like it's, it's, you know, and it's, but now we're getting to see the personalities of these chefs. And thank you so much, Katie, for joining us for this conversation. So yeah, I do want to like um, transition over to, to that. Um, yeah, um, you said a lot. Um, and I think one of the things we were trying to talk about is like, how do we take care of ourselves first? How do we take care of our families? What are the tools that we use? Um, and then how we take care of our community. And I, there, I feel like those are kind of like two different things. One of which is like you said, our chosen family. Um, it's weird. I, for some reason, decided at the beginning of COVID that I would try to take care of my friends. I prioritize them. I prioritize them based on like if they were single and if they lived alone. And the reason why I did that was because there are people who, um, you know, I, I live with two people, you know, and I have a boyfriend, a partner, and I feel like having those people nearby has like really gives, gives your life context. However, if you lose your job and you live alone and you are single, that context like fades away, you know, and you, you try to make plans with them so that they can show up, they can be accountable to those times. Because the, one of the scariest things about having too much time, especially here during the pandemic, is that all of a sudden it just slips away. Like any commitment that you have, anything that is there, it, you start to question its reality, its worth and its value. Um, so it's been super important to make plans, uh, both virtual and you know distanced, 
with people who may or may not um, have that many points of contact and like context. Um, and, you know, it, I, you know, like I said, I do have people I live with, but sometimes it's, you know, easy to lose yourself to time. And today I went to the Asian market and I haven't felt this free in a long time. Okay. Like I was so stoked to be there. I was like going up and down the aisles. By the way, we're trying to produce our own supermarket sweep, Asia style, which is like so exciting. Right? So ready. I'm so ready. Yo, throw me into Duck Loy. You think I ain't going to go through that in less than 30 seconds? I've been trained. <laughs> I know. I'm so excited. This is kind of a dream of mine for a very long time, which is like, I like go up and down the aisles and I'm like, teach it to do like I catalog in my brain, like, Ooh, let me find something new today. And then all of a sudden I'm like, we should have a supermarket sweep because this stuff is confusing. Where's the red vinegar? Where's the other type of red vinegar? Where is the freaking oyster sauce with no MSG and MSG, but like the other type of MSG, the good MSG versus the bad MSG. Like, where are those things? Yeah, okay, give so. the fish paste, the Filipino fish paste, the Cambodian fish paste, all right beside each other and they're all different colors. Yes. So so that is TBD, but it's very exciting. I'm working on production right now and it's just, I'm super excited. But the reason why I was so excited to be at uh, Mom Manila Oriental Market this today was because it was just like feeling normal again. Like people walking up and down the aisles and shopping for things that you kind of almost let drift away because it it didn't seem to matter but it actually does have a place in your life and it does matter to you and so <clears throat> bringing that back to the people that my chosen family I think it's been really important to be able to make plans with people who um live alone or just aren't very outgoing or aren't very good at making plans because I think it's really helped um at large I think with this first started and this is something I'm super proud of my sister for um, she wanted to help out, but she kind of lives a little bit further than um, the rest of us do. And she was wondering how she could help out. And at that time, we were donating a lot of meals to my other sister's organization. And so she asked, how do I help out? And this, unfortunately, you know, I, I could get into politics, but I'm not going to. But there's a lot of people in need. And so I got together with her and my niece, who is 12. And she really wanted to help out and we made a whole bunch of meals and we drove around and we comically gave them out with, with without forks which was really sad because everyone was asking for forks but what we did was we drove around we tried to find people who you know for one reason or another needed something maybe even just someone to show them that they made something that they cared about and they want to extend that um Tyrone camera you're off by the way um where am I off? No? Can you guys hear me? I'm still here. Oh, okay, got it, got it, got it. That was like a DJ set. Um, yeah, so, you know, trying to take care of your community as well. And so I know that a lot of people have been volunteering or trying to get out there. I know that um, the big thing is the election that's coming up and volunteers being needed for the polling places. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a sense, you know, there's a lot of people who have different boundaries where they feel comfortable, how much exposure that they want. But I think overall, a general sense of helping out is really well received. I think people are really grateful to even, even if it's just because of a human connection, even if it's just like really simple, um, people really respond well to any gesture forward. Is there anything you do to yeah. take care of your community? Ooh, <laughs> nice drawing cam. Um, <laughs> Wait, you gotta move it up. I can't see your face. Oh, uh, how about this one? Yeah, but that's not the big one. Okay, this is the one. This is the one. Yeah, okay. that's the one. I just see your like. Your I'll chest. do the link. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. I mean, um, I'm trying to remember while I was fixing the cameras, but yeah, thank you so much for telling us more about like yeah, like the, how you thought about your friendships even you know and like the lining up the people and, and making sure this up that was aligned with you um but I think like for me I was thinking through um you know all the energy right now I feel like everyone just needs to survive the pandemic you know that's like your first and foremost like priority you know and then like maybe help whoever is your immediate 
domicile. So, you know, I have a partner here, I have Jazzy here, making sure that we're all safe through the pandemic. And I think it, it helped me think through any energy that I put outside of myself has to be aligned with what I believe. And so, you know, I love that you, you went out, and you're like, what is it that I believe will help? And what is the energy and the time and resources I'm going to put into doing that? And so like, you know, there, there are people who do charitable acts just as, as you did, you know, and I think that's amazing. But, uh, you know, there's also like even the work that we do or the, um, our, uh, the, yeah, the community, our industry, when we start to touch back onto these places, you know, the hospitality, food, and beverage events, um, you know, like it's, we have to think again, like, all right, if I'm going to spend this energy outside of myself, but I just saying alive, what does that look like and what does that mean? And so, you know, what are your, you know, as we're kind of coming up on our last minutes here, what are your hopes, you know, for how we can like support the hospitality industry? How can we like support each other? Like what maybe like, what is the thread through all of that right now? Hmm. Well, I think the hardest part about the hospitality industry, and I think it's a lot of other industries as well, is that very quickly when the pandemic hit and um, people lost their jobs, you actually saw very quickly how, I mean, you always see it, but this is just very clear how privilege is stacked. Um, and even so in terms of who is who qualifies for unemployment and who does not. And the thing that sh just made me so worried and so sad um, was the fact that there are people who I worked alongside, you know, that didn't have any safety net, like zero. Um, and I was lucky enough to have a safety net. I was lucky enough to like have unemployment or have something there. But that was the scariest. And actually I live two blocks from the food hub where they started doing like the food bank, probably started out with one day a week and now they're up to three. And it served a lot. And I am close with the chef or the executive director who runs that program and all the different programs within the building. Um, and I talked to her about everything that she's done. And she said that people are really in need. And so one of the scariest things was that there was this industry that is kind of the backbone, you know, of, of kind of the, in some way, you know, in, in part the wellness of our um, society, which is like eating out, bringing people together, centering around food. And then all of a sudden they don't have any any safety net at all. Um, and so that's why for us, what's what we identified as kind of like the hardest part. And so we couldn't necessarily give everyone's jobs back, you know, and that's kind of the hardest part. But I think that most of the businesses, the food businesses that are open are open for that reason. Now, the stark reality is that no one is at all even breaking even. And, and people are open because they want to be open to employ people because that is, that might be, you know, one of their only options. And so in terms of the food industry, I would say to continue to support them and in and, and, and whatever way feels comfortable. You know, I don't necessarily mean that everyone should go out and eat if it doesn't feel comfortable, but there's a lot of gift cards people can purchase. There's a lot of to-go food people can purchase. There's just a lot of being there, talking to people, um, showing up. I have a friend who's just launching his to-go um, portion of his bar that's been closed for about six months now. And so that's, like I said, that's a, that's a lot of money you've just lost. And the reason why you're starting up again isn't to make it back, but it's to support the people, your community, the people around you who actually really depend on you. And, and there you realize that you have a real stake in the community. It's in a real, that's a wake up call. Sure. So that's actually our time. I know for myself, I'm kind of sticky fingered already. So I might just be hanging back for another 15 minutes. And um, <laughs> I want to say thank you, Katie. And maybe as some closing thoughts, you know, like coming back to our notes here, you know, like what does the next year look like for you? You know, what does the next year look for? Like, what is your shake the uh, eight ball of 2020? You know, what is what are those uh, five words on that on the dice in there? God, that's such a great question. Thanks, I just came up with it. <laughs> I know, and then you put me on the spot. I know. 
shake the eight ball of 2020. Maybe everyone can take a moment, think yeah. about the words that that eight ball uh, lists out on the shake the eight ball of 2020 going into 2021. We're less than three months away from that or like less than four, I guess it is. Um, but in the meantime, while everyone's figuring out their five words, um, Marissa is asking, are you really doing an Asian supermarkets week like on YouTube? I would watch that. Um, yes, yeah. right. We should totally do that. I'm, yeah, I'm okay. here. Should we brainstorm? Yes, let's brainstorm. Let's, let's brainstorm. brainstorm. I have all these ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I love it. Uh, should, like, should we like highlight different Asian markets? You know, like we should always do the controversial, like 90, uh, you know, Ranch 99, 99 Ranch situation, you know, um, mom, of course. Um, let's see, what else here? Um, Seafood City. Well, I'm just like, yeah. Hello? Seafood City. Seafood City. Yeah, I'm thinking like, okay, so this is what my like future looks like and it's, it's awesome. Um, we are going to do, it's going to be in teams and I haven't decided whether or not the people and whether or not we should go into a, like a new grocery store, like a grocery store that nobody's been to. You know what I mean? Because then, you know, you can't pre-study, you can't, you can't pre-prep. You just have to be like, all right, I can like study all the ingredients in every aisle. I can understand how merchandising goes, but just even playing field enter. Uh, I'm thinking of hiding red herrings, you know, just like we're, we're thinking of uh, basing the ingredient list on certain dishes and the winner or the loser has to buy all the groceries and then the loser also has to cook the whole thing. The idea is to base it on different food dishes uh, with really, you know, esoteric ingredients or not even so esoteric, just like not as mainstream. And then also like little plus 100 point nuggets everywhere of some really esoteric like jar of something in there. And then um, I'm not sure if the, the grocery list should ha include photos. I'm not sure if you should be able to access the internet while you do this search. Uh, I'm not really even sure about the teamwork that can happen during this, but those are all different things that could be in the mix for Supermarket Sweep. And we're really excited to produce it. I kind of want to produce it more, but I'm supposed to be a contestant. So I can't really like produce it as much as I want to, but yeah. My idea. You have a producer in your pocket. Huh? Good thing you have a producer right here. That can, uh... See, there you go. Wow. <laughs> look, at, look at that. Look at that serendipity right there. Look at that. Yeah, it's very exciting, right? Do it. I, I'm really here for it. I've been watching Supermarket Suite. I remember watching Supermarket Suite on TV and being like, damn, I'd be really good at this. Like, I'd be really Talking diapers, right? Diapers, prosciutto, diapers, prosciutto, diapers, prosciutto, pate, prosciutto, prosciutto. Ham, ham, ham. Seven hams. Go back from the yeah. new go out, buy yeah. one cheese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean <laughs> amazing. Yeah, um, and I don't know what, what, what will happen when you encounter someone in the aisle, like COVID style, like, is that you have to turn around and leave or like what other gameplay has to be way, included? Way that you have to run, like run through if you're going the opposite direction. Yeah, there's like rules. And I don't yeah. even know what they are yet. It's very exciting. And like, can you talk to, I think it's a relay race, you know? Can you talk to your partner about the ingredients? Right. Is it just words or is it a photo, you know? Because a lot of these times with Asian things, like you don't know what it looks like and you have to look it up. Are you allowed to look it up? Is that round one, round two, you could look it up? So nice. lots to consider. So Where I guess that's what my future looks like. Supermarket sweep. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Six foot long, uh, six foot radius. Um, hula hoops. Mm, 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 mm. Um, all right, so I'm going to invite everyone to get their five words on the eight ball to 2020 in the chats. And then I actually do need to start returning some equipment to the person who I borrowed all this from. So <laughs> running, running, running. Um, let's start with Dylan. What are your five words for eight ball of 2020? Let's have I mean, who knows? Uh, moving back to New York. Ah, uh, five nice. words. Nice. Got it. All right, Marissa, can I tap you in next? Um, I can also transition. 
change. Oh wait, good change, good change. And um, content. Yes, contents. All right, Ms. Tosh and Wilson, do you have a eight ball submission? My five words are don't rush and don't fear. Yes, that sounds familiar. Wilson, do you have five? Uh, I don't. <laughs> fish, we should receive, you should use fish sauce. Go out and buy fish sauce hats. Go out and yeah. buy fish sauce hats. It's one of those things that like I'm so busy trying, like I've, I've been trying to make haikus that right. words and syllables are really hard. Like, you could do so much more with words. Um, supermarket, sweep, Asia edition. Ooh, <laughs> that's about it. <laughs> supermarket, sweep, Asia edition. Any type of media that is like centered on, you know, Asian things, Asian fun, I'm all about. I think that's where I'm at. Well, it looks like we have you in the right place because 2020 NCLF is the power of we, AAPI unity. That's right. <laughs> so that said, this is Felicia with Tiny Cast Studios. <laughs> wow. Um, my five words would be fish sauce and other remedies because I know that this was very healing and I'm so glad that we had such great participation. Can we all just give a quick round of applause for Miss Katie Kwan, um, chef and founder of Rice, Paper, Scissors. Um, thank you so much for the time. And I'm so excited to, to make this into a video and to share this widely because I think this was really special. Here is the, the Tehran that came out from the session. Can we maybe see your dumplings too? Oh, yeah, yeah, hold on. Amazing. Ooh. Uh, I'm going to, well, because I have so much and we spent so much time together, I'm going to freeze them and then give them out as goodie bags to my family. That's another way to show them that I love them. Yes, love it. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day and weekends. We'll see you in the next couple of days in MCLF. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Great hands.